Thank you very much, uh, Tony. It's 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 great honor to be here today. Um, everything you said is true. Issues about gender haunt us every day of the week, and we need to take action to make sure that at the Fourth World Congress of Agroforestry, that's all taken care of in a fundamental way. What I'd like to talk about today is why somebody cares about something in particular. And in the particular case of Mars Incorporated, it has to do with the heart and soul of the company, which happens to be chocolate. Uh, we're the world's largest chocolate company. Uh, it's, it's, it's a vast story that we don't have time to tell today. But I hope if you have the opportunity, we can talk about it during the next few days. And I think this is the beginning of every conversation. It's always hard to be the agent of change. The system likes to be where it is right now. So for those of you who are pushing a boulder up a mountain, you should know that's the norm. But when you get to the top of the mountain, something else happens that's really quite profound. So why cacao science, human health, genomics, and sustainability? And this is a, a slide that I got from Tony from a few years back. And the most important thing that I think is the takeaway is that no single scientific advance will sustain an industry. So no matter how smart you are about making something or doing something, it takes more. My other favorite comment is, remember the biggest consumer of cacao are insects, funguses, and viruses. So while we hope to sell to everyone in the room our products, which are available in markets around the world, we have to recognize who our real audience is, which are these insects, funguses, and viruses, which ultimately cripple the, the small-scale farmer. And the last point is, this all costs money. To be active in any arena costs money. And profitability is the driver of businesses, but using that money wisely is really the metaphor for change. So some of you who have a chemistry background will recognize these polyphenolic compounds. 20 years ago, we discovered these in a cacao bean and realized there was something there that we weren't sure what to do with. We did studies that have gone on during that time. Uh, the conclusion is the diets rich in flavanols reverse vascular dysfunction and diabetes, highlighting the therapeutic potentials in cardiovascular disease. Now remember, I didn't say the word chocolate. This is not about chocolate. This is about something that's found in the fundamental building block of chocolate. Another study from 2012 talks about cognitive function. And we've just finished another study on this area, and it's shown that these flavanols, these epicatechins, really can have a huge effect. But not all cocoa beans have it, and not all processing delivers it. So that's important. And 30 years ago, we established a research facility in a place called Bahia, Brazil. And we have watched over those last 30 years and know what happened in 1945, and know what happened in 1960, and know what happened in 1973, and know what happened in 1990. Three percent of the forest is left, the most biodiverse tree forest on Earth, with 287 species per hectare. It's down to this small fragment. And this was caused by cacao and cattle, and now coffee. So a few years back, we talked to a chap named Roger Leakey, sitting in the back of the room here and working together with a statistician at the Center for Hydrology and Ecology in Scotland and scientists from a group called USG University Estudial de Santa Cruz in Brazil, we developed what this is called a Nelder fan. And it was developed, and it's about nine hectares of land to do one plot, to determine what happens when you have short trees and medium-sized trees and tall trees, and you interplant cocoa, and sometimes you put wood trees in there and fruit trees, and the point was it was a way of thinking about cocoa that was different from anything that had ever happened before. And this is the outcome of it. And while this looks rather haphazard at the end of 24 months, what really ends up happening is a vast system that produces 1,500 kilos of cacao per hectare when the average yield around the world is 450 kilos. And with that knowledge, you could triple the yield and triple the income, a business called Mars Incorporated decided to go down a path that was really quite different and unusual. We decided that we would spend our money and we would try to train people around the world to use this. 
And someone said to us, but how do you eat when you do this? Where does your food come from? And this is some of the 16 food crops that came off of this plot for the first three years before cocoa started to become productive. An average of 32 metric tons of cassava. We didn't even count the bananas, the plantains, the tomatoes, the beans, the corn, the chilies, what have you the papayas, the mangoes, because this was all business driven to feed the people who were there and to additionally give them the ability to produce cocoa at a higher income. But that's not the only model we worked on. And I'll come back to this reference in a minute. It may be that as Ed Phelps says that there's different models of conglomeration in agriculture that are important to understand and one of them is very specifically the notion that when we grow things, we'll be growing them differently than we've grown them in the past. And this is full sun, open production. This is what a tree looks like in that system. And the point that I'm trying to make is, and I'll get to it later, we believe the yield potential is close to 10,000 kilos per hectare from 450 kilos currently. But then in certain parts of the world, they ask you, where are you going to get the water? in the dry season, because a tree, even though it can live during a dry season, might need some water. So working with the uh, Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development in Vietnam, we designed a water collection system based on work of Bill Mollison, the great Australian ecologist. And what we ended up doing is being able to collect from a, um, a site that was really quite rough and this is the hand of the Minister of Agriculture, a little drawing I had made for him how I was going to do this, and he smiled at me and said, go ahead, it's your money. And this is what it looked like. And it was largely deforested years and years ago and covered with bamboo that you see on the side. And working with women, we cleared this entire plot, over 2,000 hectares of land. And, and the key to it was that we had water and we had an irrigation system. And this is what we did. We collected water off the hillside through things called swales. And at first we were going to rubber line these ponds. And when I smelled the, the, the fragrance coming off the rubber, I realized I didn't want to use that material, especially to irrigate a tree or to have children play in. And we determined that the local craftsmen were able to build these reservoirs for us much cheaper than the plastic. So now these dot the entire Central Highlands and Dock Lock Province. We could collect almost 3.4 million liters of water in this pond. Part two. We held the Kumasi consensus meeting. A number of you in this room were at that meeting. And there was the Second World Congress of Agroforestry. At that time, I said a funny thing that Mars would not certify poverty, which is the continuation of 450 kilos of cacao. That would simply not work. That wouldn't meet the goals of a company that holds itself to very high standards. So we started a sustainable cacao initiative. And we'll go through it very quickly. Everybody knows about cycles of decline. Everybody knows it's economic, social, and environmental. Everyone realizes that, but what is the intention to change those things? And while people hold meetings on mitigation of climate change, what do you tell the farmer who's supposed to adapt his uh, product, his activity, his trees, his row crops, to adaptation versus mitigation. Mitigation is something we hope we get started on and our children complete for us. But at the same time, farmers in the rural sector still have to be productive. So we called it the vision for change. And it really should have been called visions for change. The first thing was to assemble a genome. When I grew up as a young man doing genomics, genetics, working out of Rockefeller University, we had a device that had 96 wells in the top to put DNA in. And today in this little single chip that I hold in my hand is 1.2 billion wells. So the speed from which I began to the speed which I am today in doing work has changed radically. So we announced that we were going to sequence the cocoa genome. And it was a great story and I was very proud. But they missed the real story when we sent it out the first time. We were going to put this information into the public domain. We were going to give it away and not control it. Because where we win in the business world is inside of our factories and in marketing and the purchase of product, not in the production of cacao. 
And it was an uncommon collaboration. And I was in Papua New Guinea working on Coco, and I got a call that, that asked me had I read the Wall Street Journal that morning. And I explained to the person that the Wall Street Journal was really not delivered daily to Bougainville. And so they read this to me, and this is one of our partners saying why cacao matters to a smarter planet. And it's because it's almost a billion dollars in losses to the rural sector that could be recovered if we understood plant diseases and the insect predation. And this was the uncommon collaboration. It wasn't just academics with academics. It wasn't business just with business. It was an entire mixture of that nature that had been separated for so long. And we determined at that time that this would be the model going forward for everything we did. And one of the first things we discovered was resistance to Meliopter perniciosa, or witch's broom, which had wiped out the entire Brazilian industry in less than 24 months. And we realized at that moment that we had made a step forward that could be shared with African scientists. So yield potential, globally it is 450 kilos. And look at these trees bearing fruit, as you would call it, like nothing else in the world. So these are some experiments we have done. So we have real, predicted, and potential. So the real is between 2,700 and 4,500, more than 10 times the average. So then we realized that we had to empower cocoa farmers, and they had to move forward, and they had to understand the future, not the past. So success is complex. You got to put your money where your mouth is. That's what one of the ag ministers in West Africa said to me. Where's the money? I said, it's right on the table. What are you going to do to participate in this process? And so we figured out how to get the yield to 1,500 plus kilos. Because at 1,500 plus kilos, it outproduces every other crop in that region of West Africa. It's more profitable. So the current 450, a little knowledge and pest control is 135 kilos. Planting material is 585 to 1,000. And fertilizer is 351, 1,500 kilos. Seems so simple, right? Why don't you just go out and do it? Because there is no infrastructure. So you have to build the infrastructure. Farmers need to see and believe what you're talking about as well. It's not enough for a group of people to show up and say, do this. There's no reason to do it. And it's also not the responsibilities of NGOs who have a short-term vision. We have a generational vision as a business. We want to be in business in 100 years. And this is what one of our uh, collaborators looked like in 2011 in August. It's a picture from Tony. So you have to help them rebuild their infrastructure to get them back to where they were so they could move forward. We had to have a partner. We couldn't do this alone, so we chose the World Agroforestry Center as our partner. We changed the model of training. We brought in Asians who were already starting to press towards 2,000 kilos to show what grafting was, to show how to take care of trees. These were people who worked for Mars. We worked on community development. We worked on village community centers who would work on the product, and we worked on productivity. We built the staff. As I said, community development. And you'll notice in this picture there's quite a few women involved because many of the farmers are women as well. And then we in introduced something that everyone said wouldn't work in this crop, and that was called grafting. And we built a somatic embryogenesis facility because we need one billion budwood sticks for Cote d'Ivoire alone. Think of that, one billion budwood sticks to be grafted. This is what it looks like after nine months on the side grafts. That's more than the tree had produced the year before. And a highly precocious one had 30 pods on it after nine months. The average tree has six to eight pods. And then we explained to people what fertilizer would do. And all of a sudden, the lights went off. We want to have a shared value, which is high quality third party certification. Low quality is rejected, high quality is rewarded. And the only future for this is through production. At the Second World Congress, I said, we will not certify poverty. And it was the right thing to have said, but today, let me be absolutely clear, we will only certify prosperity. The idea of certifying 450 kilos 
is an insult to the farmer, to us, to the general public. That simply won't work. Part three, every hour 300 children die of malnutrition. It's a horrible thought. So we want to improve human health through making plants more nutritious. We formed the African Orphan Crops Consortium in 2011, and in 2013, I mean, the December 2nd, 2013, we started the African Plant Breeding Academy, which is organized and held at the World Agroforestry Center. This is the opening class, the opening session. That's the Minister of Agriculture between the guy in the beard and Tony Simon smiling. A few of our students were well represented by women. The first 26 genomes will be sequenced this year. In my lifetime, I never thought I'd do more than one genome. Now we're doing 101 because we're catching a technology wave. This is the list of the, the crops, 101. 15 of them are trees. 15 crops are trees that will be fully sequenced. The first is Adansonia Kalima because it's the icon of Africa. It is an uncommon collaboration. And look at the parties. Beijing Genomic Institute, World Wildlife Fund, the iPlant Collaborative, UC Davis, Life Technologies, NEPAD, Biosciences of East and Central Africa. These are people who, again, don't collaborate together. They never have joined the game. And here they are moving forward. 101 reference genomes established in three years. Resequencing of the cultivars will be done at the World Agroforestry Center using an ion proton platform, which is simply a pH meter. But it's big data. This is really big data. 101 reference genomes. Each one of those will be resequenced from cultivars in Africa 100 to 150 times. They're building a pipe, as they refer to it, in technology that takes the information from Shenzhen, China, to Nairobi, the information from Nairobi to Shenzhen, and all of that information to a public site called iPlant. Every bit of the data will be held in the public domain. This is how it happens, a little science to the African citizen. This is what you get with public domain breeding. We want to significantly improve the nutrition of an entire continent. It's not so hard to think about it. It's not so hard to do it. And we want to positively affect the development of every child. Shall India or China be the next uncommon collaborator in this process? So success is continuously evolving support and discovery. And this was Paul Singh and I were talking the other day on Sunday morning. And this is the key. Success is continually evolving. Don't ever believe that the way you start is the way you're going to finish. And as a business, we recognize that spending this money is the best thing to secure our future. You might say it's self-serving. You might say it serves only the need of the farmers. For everything we try, there's at least 10 critics for what we do. So we invite all the critics to join us as well. Because the future will be a sustainable future driven by prosperity, not by poverty. Thank you very much.